What's up guys, Mike here, the Detroit Borg, checking out the new Galaxy Note 5, which picks up a really sleek all metal and glass design, which is even more compact than the previous generation, while retaining a very large and very vibrant and clear 5.7 inch Quad HD Super AMOLED display, which has been improved for the latest generation. We also pick up many features from the Galaxy S6, including an improved fingerprint scanner, along with wireless charging built into the back. We also get the latest Exynos Octa-Core processor, along with four gigs of RAM, and you have 32 or 64 gig storage options built in. We also get improved S Pen hardware, so it now feels like you're using a ballpoint pen on the glass display. And we also have some new software tricks, which we'll explore in this video. Next up, let's get to the unboxing of the Galaxy Note 5. And this is the T-Mobile version. If you get a carrier version like the one I have here, AT&T, this is actually the one I've been reviewing for the past few days. It doesn't come with the original packaging. It does come with most of the original accessories, but they've been tweaked here. It doesn't have one of the carrying cases for the headphones, and I'll show you that when I get to this box. So on the back, of course, we have our specs, and let's go ahead and pull off this sleeve. And we do have some tabs to cut along the side. So lifting the lid inside, we'll find our white Galaxy Note 5. Of course, it's available in a variety of other colors. We have some labels here we do not want to throw out, apparently. And then let's go ahead and pull this out. As you can see, it's wrapped in plastic. Very neat and tidy here. No labels. Let's go ahead and push this out. Should slide right out. There we go. Now, the first thing that jumps out right away is just how sleek this feels. We have that nice glass design, no plastic, smooth edges along the side. Doesn't feel as boxy as the original Note 4. Very nice looking phone, but let's set that aside for just a moment so we can clear the contents here. Inside, we'll find something we haven't seen before on a Note, which is a SIM ejection tool. So instead of removing the back panel, you eject the SIM along the side of the phone. Lifting the tray, we'll find all of our accessories neatly packaged here, including a set of headphones inside a carrying case. These are Samsung's new in-ear style headphones that are kind of similar to ear pods. They do come with replacement ear tips to change the size if you want, and they do include an inline remote control and microphone. We also get our micro USB 2.0 charging cable, which accompanies the fast charger. This is technology we've seen for a while now, but this quickly charges the 3000 milliamp hour battery inside your phone. Below that, we'll find our replacement S Pen nibs. So those those nibs do wear out over time, so they do give you spares and a removal and installation tool. Taking a close look at the sleek design of the new Galaxy Note 5, it is all glass and metal covered in Corning Gorilla Glass 4, and it feels really premium in the hand. It's very similar to the Galaxy S6, just blown up to scale. Now, the thing that really strikes me here is the very thin bezel surrounding the display. That makes the phone a little more compact, combined with the curved edge on the back of the phone, so it feels really nice and compact in the hand, despite the size of the display. So getting to this display, it has the same specs of last year. 5.7 inches, Quad HD, 1440 by 2560, good for 518 pixels per inch. And it's Super AMOLED, so you get these very bright, vivid colors and deep blacks, and it's a stunning display to look at, and it looks even better with even clearer whites and more vibrant colors. They've done a really good job here. So along the top, you'll find a familiar layout. We have an LED notification light next to an ambient light sensor and proximity sensor, and of course you have your earpiece. We also have that 5 megapixel camera with an f1.9 aperture. It's a fantastic camera. It's the same one in the Galaxy S6 and records video up to QHD resolution. Down below, we'll find a home button which integrates the new fingerprint scanner also from the Galaxy S6. So instead of swiping on the key, you just press your finger to it. We also have our backlit navigation keys which includes recent apps back and they have dual functionality which I'll explore in this video. Along the back, you have this curved Corning Gorilla Glass 4 back panel which houses NFC and the new faster wireless wireless charging. Now like the Galaxy S6, this also supports wireless Qi and power mat, but the Note 4 features next generation faster wireless charging with a compatible charger, which unfortunately I don't have here yet. Toward the top, once again, very similar camera system to the Galaxy S6, 16 megapixels, f1.9 aperture. We also have optical image stabilization, 4K video recording, and right next to it, we have a color spectrum sensor for better balancing the white balance of your shot. We also have an LED flash and a heart rate sensor. Along the side, you can see we have this nice rounded metal frame. Now, we don't have that nice polished chamfered edge like we used to have from the previous Note 4, but again, a very sleek design. Toward the top, we have our antenna insulators breaking up 
up the frame. We also have our microphone and a nano SIM tray, which you can eject with a SIM ejection tool. Along the right side, we'll find our sleep wake power button, which is along this narrow edge, but it's not sharp like on the Note edge or the Galaxy S6 edge. Same on the left side. We also have these high mounted Vime keys. Along the bottom, we can see there is no USB type C connector. This is a micro USB 2.0 port, which does support fast charging, of course. We also have our headphone jack and our speaker grill. And right next to it, you can see your microphone. And of course you have your new stylus or S Pen. So the S Pen now has a clicking mechanism at the top, which is used to eject it. Uh, this is also used to reinsert it. So when you put it back into its silo, you just press the button to secure it. But otherwise that clicking mechanism does not retract the pen nib, which I thought it did. The S Pen design is very familiar, has a nicer look to it, it's a little smoother, and the color matches the frame of the phone you have. And you can see we have our button along the side for selecting items in the interface, and we'll explore that in this video. Now taking a quick look at the design differences between the Note 4 and the Note 5. The new Note 5 is noticeably thinner and more compact than the previous generation with very thin bezels on either side of the phone and shorter bezels on the top and bottom. That combines with a rounded design of the back panel to make the phone feel much more compact and less bulky than the original Note 4. Toward the top, things have been moved around a bit. So we have a new and improved front facing camera. The ambient light sensor and proximity sensor have been moved around and we have an LED notification light. Toward the bottom, we have our new home button, which integrates the new fingerprint sensor instead of the swipe gesture from the original Note 4. Of course, on the back, things have changed quite a bit here. We go from a plastic removable back panel to an all glass back panel, which incorporates wireless charging. The speaker has also been relocated from the back to the side of the phone, and the camera hardware has improved here with a new 16 megapixel sensor and an f1.9 aperture. We still have an LED flash, but we now have a color spectrum sensor along with a heart rate monitor. Along the right side, you'll find a smaller sleep wake power button in roughly the same location. Along the left side, we have our volume controls in the same location, but they're now individual buttons instead of a volume rocker. Toward the bottom, we have a more integrated S Pen design, which is ejected instead of pulling it out with your fingernail. You can also see we have our speaker toward the bottom instead of on the back, and the headphone jack has been relocated from the top to the bottom. We still have a micro USB 2.0 port, and we have some microphones. Toward the top, you can see the headphone jack has been replaced by the Nano SIM tray, which used to be behind the back cover on the Note 4. And a big omission here is the IR LED blaster. So that is now gone with the Note 5. Next, I wanna take a detailed look at the software experience and all the features that come with it. And of course, Samsung does quite a bit here. So this is powered by Android 5.1.1, skinned with the latest version of TouchWiz, which has been updated with the Note 5. So we can quickly launch into our phone dialer or the camera app right from the lock screen, swipe down to see our notifications. We can also swipe down from the top to see our quick setting toggles. Now we also have our new fingerprint scanner. So all I have to do is tap the home button to unlock it. There's no swiping here. Now the lock screen has another trick here. So I'm gonna eject the new S Pen, so you have that little clicking mechanism. You can see that little animation that pops up when you eject the S Pen, and now I can make this off screen or screen off note. So I can say hello. So I can do all of this without unlocking the device. All I have to do is eject the S Pen. So it's nice and handy. You can actually hear the sound of pen on paper when you're writing. So I can delete this if I want. I can erase it if I want to erase that, I can. Or I can save it, and it will save it, as you can see here from my notification panel. I can tap on that, unlock the device, takes me right to it. And as you can see, it unlocks really quickly with that fingerprint scanner. You can also double tap the home button to launch quickly into the camera app. So again, very fast, just like the Galaxy S6. You can also see I have this little memo icon up here because that's minimized. So I can jump right back to it if I want, or I can close it by deleting it. So getting back to the home screen, it does have that familiar Samsung look from the Galaxy S6, but you can see the icon pack has been updated as well as a few other tweaks, but otherwise it's fairly close to that experience. So we can swipe between our available home screens here, and of course it depends on what carrier you have, as I do in this case, I have AT&T. I can swipe all the way to the right to get to briefing, Flipboard briefing. Uh, so this basically aggregates all my news and information based on categories, and I can modify this up here. Now in this panel, I can rearrange the categories. I can unselect them if I don't wanna receive anything from that category, or I can edit what feeds into that category here. So for example, if I want iPhone coverage or Mac software. So once that's all done, we now have this feed aggregating all these news stories, which we can tap on for the full screen experience. Now, many people may not want this Flipboard briefing at all, so you can disable it if you want. Just pinch in and out on the home screen to get to your editor. 
So now I can disable it if I want so it goes off. Uh, from here I can also change the home screen. So if I want uh, this to be the home screen, I can select it. I'm gonna stick with the original home screen here. And I can also rearrange them if I want or take them up here to delete. We can also swipe all the way to the right to create new home screens if we want and we can change our wallpaper. So we do get a new set of wallpapers with the Note 5 and they're nice and vibrant, especially with this uh, Super AMOLED display. It really takes advantage of the bright vivid colors here. We also have our themes and you can see three of them are here by default and you can download them or you can go to the theme store to pick a variety of other themes. We also have screen grid options. So if you want to space out your icons from the default configuration, you can. So 5x5 is here by default. We have 4x5 or 4x4. Now with one swipe down gesture, we get to our notifications as well as our quick setting toggles, which stays up here persistently. So we can adjust our screen brightness. We can select auto if we want. Of course, we have toggles for Wi-Fi location, sound, auto rotate, Bluetooth, S Finder, and Quick Connect. We have airplane mode, do not disturb, and power saving, and this is editable. So we can go up to edit, or not editable, you can't eat it, but you can edit it. So we have flashlight, ultra power saving mode, private mode, screen mirroring, syncing, and NFC. So you can rearrange this if you want. You just drag and drop things up here, but you're limited to what appears up here. Now, I just want to quickly mention that the T-Mobile version and most versions sold around the world will have S Finder and Quick Connect as a separate bar down here, which you can turn off. So if you go up to edit, you'll see toward the bottom, you can disable S Finder and Quick Connect. Now these buttons do act as quick toggles, but if you tap and hold on them, they'll take you directly to that control panel for even more controls. So for example, if you tap and hold on Do Not Disturb, you get to more controls such as scheduling the Do Not Disturb features instead of just turning it on or off. We also have S Finder, which allows me to search the entire device for anything. So for example, if I wanna search for Android, it will search for settings, bookmarks under Chrome, my files, as well as performing the web search if I want. I can also limit my search by type, so I can see conversation, settings, images, music, videos, notes, time, as well as location, which unfortunately includes my current location, which I don't want to share. And then we have our tags. Now there is a setting under Wi-Fi I think is worth pointing out. So if we go to settings here, go to more, you can see we have smart network switch, which will allow this device to switch between Wi-Fi or your cellular network for improved performance. Down below, we have our classic Samsung off-screen navigation keys. So of course we have our home button. So if you tap it, it takes you home, double tap, takes you to the camera app and pressing and holding launches into Google Now. We also have our recent apps viewer, so you can see all of your recent apps, which you can swipe to dismiss or close all if you want. And of course, we have the back button. Now the recent apps does have a dual function, so if you tap and hold on it, it brings up split screen view. So with split screen view, you're prompted to select certain apps to open side by side here. So I can open up the browser and I can open up compatible apps here. So for example, I can select, let's go ahead with Instagram. So I can browse the web while browsing Instagram, resize the window here. Now if I tap on the window, that becomes the active window and it's highlighted in blue. So when I tap that circle, I have several options. So I can switch between the top and bottom if I wanna mix it up here. I can also select text from one window to paste it in the other. I can also minimize the window or maximize the window or close it. And when I minimize the window, it becomes this little thumbnail that floats around, which I can access again by tapping on it. And now I get this floating window here. Now, if you swipe across from the upper corner, you can minimize the window here and float it around and resize it if you want. And again, we can do that with Instagram here, and we can do this with up to five apps at once. So right now I have five windows I can move around here, but if I press the home key, it actually minimizes them all to this little badge view. So I can move them around here and you can see I have five open. I can't do more than that. They'll tell me I can't do it. Uh, so I can bring them forward, press again to minimize them. And if I wanna close them, just tap and hold on them and I can take them up to remove. We can also access split screen mode from the overview feature. So apps that are compatible with split screen will have this little icon next to the close icon. So for example, I can enable split screen with YouTube and then I can select the split screen app below it. So for example, I can select one of the open apps or I can swipe to the right to access one of the compatible apps. Now we still have S voice in here and you can access it by speaking to it. Hi Galaxy. S voice is listening. Speak now. What's the weather like in Rochester Hills, Michigan? It's 80 with lots of sunshine today. So we get this little pop-out interface which we can dismiss when we're done with it without actually jumping directly to the app. Now if you enable the feature, you can access the S-Voice voice assistant from a locked state. Hi Galaxy. S-Voice is listening. Speak now. How tall is the Empire State Building? 
It looks like the answer is about 1,250 feet. We also get a new app drawer here, which has been simplified considerably from the options we used to have with the previous Note or previous versions of TouchWiz. So we can see they've already organized some of the apps for us. We have at t Google, and Samsung organized here, so I can tap on them to expand them out. I can also edit the name or edit the folder color here. So if I want a different color, I can. So green with Google or Android, I think works pretty well. And then you can see the background for that app color has changed. Now I can swipe between my pages here and I can order them. So if I want to order them A to Z, I can do that, uh, but I don't because I want to keep everything in their folders. Now if I go up to edit, I can move things around to folder them. So if I want to create new folders, I can just by dragging and dropping the apps over each other. But you can see some apps have these little icons which indicate they can be uninstalled or disabled. So for example, I can select this item and just disable it. And if I want to re-enable, I have to go to the application manager. So there we go, we're gonna click done. Unfortunately, you can't hide apps like you could with the previous software. In terms of the app selection besides the carrier bloatware, we have some Samsung apps like Samsung's Milk Music Service, a voice recorder, scrapbook, my files for a file manager, and then we have Samsung Gear for connecting your smartwatch or other accessories. Uh, so we have my files. It's a very slick file manager. Again, it's very consistent with the TouchWiz UI design. So we can see our images, videos, uh, audio documents, download history, device storage, and our cloud storage options. Of course, we also have S Health for keeping track of our fitness goals, which work with gear accessories, the phone itself, the heart rate monitor on the phone, and that sort of thing. And all we have to do is log into our Samsung account to transfer the information or set it up through here. So let's go ahead and measure our heart rate. So all we have to do is press the uh, heart rate monitor on the back. You can see it lights up and then it will measure for us. We'll see how high my heart rate is right now. So 80 beats per minute sounds about right for now. Next up, let's measure our blood oxygen level. Now, incidentally, this no longer has the UV sensor that the Note 4 had. So 95%, so I guess I'm healthy, but we can go up to info to find out more. We also have Samsung Pay, and similar to Apple Pay, this allows you to digitally load your cards or reward cards to your device, and you can use NFC and your fingerprint sensor uh, for secure payment. But this goes a step further with MST, or Magnetic Secure Transmission. So that basically means you can use this anywhere you can swipe your card. Next up, let's take a look at the new S Pen and the updated interface. So we have a new error command utility, which includes Action Memo, Smart Select, Screen Write, and a few apps. So we have S Note, Photos, and Chrome. Now you can modify these under settings, but I want to show you what happens when you move away from error command. So you can see you can use the device with the S Pen just fine, and the error command utility is here floating in the background when you need it. All I have to do is tap on it, and it's right there. Now, as always, the S Pen is pressure sensitive and the screen can actually detect the presence of the S Pen from a distance, so you can actually get this little hovering cursor over whatever you're doing. So getting back to Air Command and some of the features, let's check out Action Memo. So this brings up the S Memo app. So let's go ahead and write down a number. All right, so let's say this is a phone number and I want to add it to a contact or make a phone call. I can go up to More, I can go to Link to Action, and now you can see it automatically detects where this is and has transcribed it, hopefully accurately. Uh, so you can go to phone and just dial that number. And as you can see, it did it accurately. And then we can go back to the memo here and change that action. So if we want to go to contact, we can create a new contact. We have other actions here like messages, email, internet, map, or tasks. So again, depending on what you're writing here, you can quickly link to those actions. We also have Smart Select. So with Smart Select, we get different selecting tools, rectangle, lasso, oval, and auto shape, which is grayed out in this case because I guess it can't be used in this situation. But I can go ahead and select a bit of text if I want. So I can go ahead and select this. And as you can see, it selects it without actually including this little hovering error command utility, so that's nice. So we can save it to the gallery, write on it, so we can annotate it if we want, save it to scrapbook and that sort of thing. We also have Screen Write which allows you to take a screen grab and you can annotate on it. But there's a feature hidden in here which is called scroll capture. So if you want to continue capturing the entire website here, in this case 9 to 5 Google, let's go and select it. This will continue scrolling through the interface and add to that capture. So we can capture more, capture more, capture more until we filled up as much as we want here. As you can see, it's building along the right side here. And now we have a full screen grab of the entire website. We can also jump right to S Note, so we can see all of our action memos up here, which we can expand out. Uh, we can also create a new message here. And this is pressure sensitive, so the harder you press on the screen, the thicker the line gets, or the lighter the line gets. Now these are app shortcuts which we can modify. So if we jump to settings, we can modify the shortcuts that appear here. 
So right now I have S Note, which was there by default, Photos or Chrome, but I can change all of this just by removing them. So if I wanna change this up to, let's grab something else here. Let's go with Gallery, I can select it. We can also disable the floating icon. So uh, that error command icon no longer stays there persistently when you uh, minimize it. So for example, if I take out the S Pen, and if I move away from it, it disappears. But I can bring it back forward just by tapping the S Pen key along the side here to reinvoke it. We also get a new handwriting keyboard we can access from settings here. The only problem I'm running into, as you can see right there, is that when I'm gripping the pen, I'm unintentionally activating the error command. Uh, so let's try this again. Hello. This is a test. So there you go. Now if you press and hold the power button along the side, you get to power off airplane mode, restart, or emergency mode. So what is emergency mode? So emergency mode is very similar to ultra power saving mode. It's designed to save battery life and give you some tools here for emergency situations. So I can see my notifications. I can unlock the device with my fingerprint and I have things like flashlight, emergency alarm. That's very loud. Uh, share my location with context, which I can designate. Uh, of course, I have access to the phone and internet, and I can see an estimate of my battery life. I could also add additional apps like Twitter, Facebook, or Maps, which again are apps that could be useful in an emergency situation. Next up, let's take a look at our settings panel. So you can see we have quick settings, connections, devices, personal system, and that's it. Now we have more up here, so we can edit our quick settings, which is the first panel. So you can select specific quick settings you want quick access to without having to dig through your settings panel. Of course, we can also just search. So if you want to search for display, comes up right away, takes you right to the display control panel. Now at and does tweak the settings panel so we have this tab view instead of this list view which is available on most devices including this T-Mobile version and you can go up here to edit quick settings. Otherwise, uh, the features here are pretty much identical. So anyway, this is our quick settings panel. So you can see S Pen themes, help, display, sounds, and notifications, and data usage right here. And again, you can modify that. Under connections, we have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, airplane mode, mobile hotspot, and tethering, data usage, mobile networks, NFC, and payments, and more connection settings. So under NFC payments, we have Android Beam, as well as Tap and Pay, so you can enable this as well. We also have sounds and notifications, which includes our LED indicator. So if you want to turn this off, you can. This is where we'll also find our Do Not Disturb schedule. So if you want to modify it, you can, as well as the behavior. We have vibrations, so we have our vibration patterns, vibration intensity, feedback, and more. All of that manageable here. Ringtones and sounds. So if you want to turn off the touch sounds, which are on by default, you can. Personally, I find them a little annoying. You also have dial keypad tone and more. We also have our display settings, so we have one-handed operation. So we can enable this. We can reduce screen size by triple tapping the home button. And we also have one-handed input for certain keyboards. So let's go ahead and turn that on to show you how that works. So with reduce screen size enabled, I can triple tap the home screen. And now I have this view here, which I can swipe between left hand and right hand side. So that means it's more thumb reachable. Now with one-handed operation, again, the phone dialer or the calculator keypad or even the keyboard can be swapped between the left hand and right hand side. We also have Smart Stay, which is on by default, and this is a very familiar Samsung feature that basically monitors for the presence of your eyes, keeps the display on, or turns it off depending on whether you're looking at it or not. We also have our screen modes, which includes Adapt Display, which I recommend. You also have AMOLED Cinema, AMOLED Photo, and Basic, which warms it up a bit. We also have our S Pen settings, which includes Air View. So basically, you can hover the tip of the pen over something on the display and it will pop on information such as a photo gallery, a calendar event, or something like that. And it's a familiar feature we've seen before. We also have direct pen input. So if you hover the tip of the pen over a text input box and click the pen button along the side, this will allow you to handwrite the text instead of typing it out. You can also enable or disable the pointer, the screen off memo feature, S Pen Alert. So if you walk away with the S Pen detached, it will actually notify you by ringing the phone. You can also turn off pen detection, which will save battery life. We also have motions and gestures, a familiar feature from other Samsung devices. So one of them is direct call. Now, if you want to know what these are, just swipe between these panels up here. So direct call, if you're looking at a message or if you're looking at contact details, just raise the phone to your ear, automatically calls them. Smart alert, if you have pending notifications and you pick up the phone while it's laying on the table, it will vibrate to let you know. And then we have mute. So if you want to mute your call or alarm, just place the phone flat down. We also have palm swipe capture. So if you want to grab a screen grab, just swipe across the screen like so. 
And then we also have our application manager, which is broken down by application manager and default application. So you can manage that here. So if you want to change your default messaging app, you can select it here and choose Hangouts if you want. So under application manager, you can see downloaded, running, all your apps, disabled apps, as I showed you earlier under the app drawer. Under personal, we have our wallpaper and themes as well as lock screen and security. So we can enable our fingerprint scanner from here. So you can see our fingerprints. So let's go ahead and add a new fingerprint to show you the process, which has been streamlined and sped up here. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a new fingerprint and now I'm gonna use my index finger. So that's all there is to it. And we have some other features we can use such as web sign-in with our fingerprint. And we can also verify our Samsung account with our fingerprint. So now if I go to the lock screen, I can use my thumb or I can use my index finger. We also have easy mode, which I often call grandma mode. So it simplifies the interface here and you can select specific apps or disable certain apps for easy mode. So again, simplified interface, date and time, current weather conditions, and most used apps right here. Swipe to the right and you can add speed dial contacts. Swipe all the way to the right here, you have additional apps which you can manage. Under system, we'll find battery. So battery includes some of our power saving modes, which also act as quick setting toggles up here. So again, you can see power saving as well as ultra power saving mode. So standard power saving mode will basically dial back uh, performance to improve battery life, but not completely cripple the device. And I'll tell you exactly what happens here. You can also modify when this enables. So we can immediately turn this on or only have it turned on at certain battery percentages, such as 5%, 50%, 20%, or 50%. So if you want to automatically enable it, you can. Now the purpose of ultra power saving mode is to make this device last as long as possible. So you can still place and receive phone calls, message, access the internet, so we have the phone dialer, messaging, internet, you can add additional apps. So you're limited to social networking apps, voice recorder, clock, and calculator. Checking out this camera app, a lot going on here. So we can tap anywhere to focus on the scene. We can also manually adjust exposure with this little controller that pops out. Of course, we can zoom in and out really smoothly here too. And with 16 megapixels of resolution, looks like I hit the shutter release. Uh, with 16 megapixels of resolution, even cropped or zoom images look really crisp and clear. And it focuses really quickly. And we can switch between the front facing and rear facing camera. And I'm not intentionally blocking it here. That's just the way I'm holding it. And we'll demonstrate that in a bit. Along the side, you can see some of your quick settings, which include some of the effects you can add if you want. We also have HDR, auto on or off. We have timer, flash auto on and off, as well as our resolution. So we have 16 megapixels at 16 by nine, which is great. And then we have our settings panel. So we have our video resolution. So we have UHD, QHD, Full HD at 60 frames per second, Full HD at 30 frames per second, HD or VGA. We also have tracking AF and we have video stabilization, but it's only available under Full HD or below, not uh, Full HD at 60 frames per second or anything like that. So if you want the best stabilization, go with 1080p at 30 frames per second. 4K is still optically stabilized though, which looks pretty good. We have other things like quick launch. So if you wanna turn this on and off, we also have voice command and I'll demonstrate that. A volume key functions, which can operate as your shutter release or zoom button. And you can also reset your settings to default. So let's say, cheese, shoot, record video. So there we go, we're recording in 4K. We can pause it or resume it. What you can't do in 4K is take photographs simultaneously. Taking a look at our camera modes, there's a lot going on here. We have auto mode, pro mode, which is interesting. This allows you to manually control basically every function of the camera uh, from the focusing to the white balance, to the exposure, uh, to the shutter speed, as well as the exposure compensation levels. And we also have our filters up here. We also have selective focus. So when you take a photograph, it focuses both the foreground and background subject independently. And you can modify this later when you edit the photo. We also have other features like panorama, video collage, slow motion or fast motion, as well as virtual shot. And you can download additional modes. So there's quite a few of them to pick from now, such as beauty face. A lot of these have been pulled out. They used to be included dual camera modes. So if you wanna shoot both the uh, front facing camera and rear facing camera, you can use that mode. Shot and more for recording voice with your clip, sport shot, surround shot, and quite a few others. Now the most talked about new mode with this camera app is live broadcast. So this will log into your Google account and you can broadcast live to your YouTube account. Now as I'm broadcasting here, I can go ahead and click share to share it to Twitter or other services here. So I'm just gonna tweet this out. So I can resume my broadcast after I share it. And now people have gotten a message that I'm live broadcasting and can watch me live. And I can flip between the front facing and rear facing camera. 
So hey guys, how's it going? Just testing out the live broadcasting feature. Now, unfortunately, what I can't see is the live chat that's available. Now, if you go to the web view of this live feed, you can actually interact with this. Uh, you can also see the likes or dislikes in the lower corner here. But anyways, I'm able to get up to 1080p resolution on a good Wi-Fi connection. So generally speaking, it works pretty well, but of course over cellular, your performance will degrade. The front-facing camera also has some familiar Samsung tricks. So if we hold up our hand here, it reads it, and it starts a countdown to take a selfie. We also have something called Wide Selfie. So we can snap a photograph and pivot the phone left and right to take a panorama. So if you have more people around you, you can get them all in. We can also hold our finger on the heart rate monitor, and when we're ready to take our selfie, we can lift it, and it snaps it. I don't find this particularly useful, as you can see here. Let's try this again. There you go. So it's no secret that Samsung makes outstanding camera systems. The Galaxy S6 is one of the highest rated in terms of camera quality, and that's basically the same sensor we have in this camera, and delivers excellent results as expected. Images come out clear, crisp, with good color reproduction and exposure. Nice depth of field, and it's able to find focus quickly and accurately in most lighting conditions. In terms of low light performance, this camera really benefits from the large f1.9 aperture and optical image stabilization, which combines to create very smooth images with good exposure, good sharpness, and color reproduction without over-processing. In terms of video, once again, we can record in 4K and we have optical image stabilization to make handheld video look smooth. And as expected, everything looks fantastic with bright, vivid colors, good exposure and clarity. And the camera is able to find exposure and focus smoothly and accurately without hunting around. What's going on guys, this is Mike, the Detroit Borg, testing out the 5 megapixel front facing camera recording at QHD resolution, so not quite 4K, but close. Uh, this is definitely the best looking front facing camera I've ever used. It's very similar to the one on the Galaxy S6, if not identical. It's an f1.9 aperture, lets a lot of light in, nice wide angle lens so you can see everything. Good color reproduction, really sharp, and great audio as well. In terms of our Geekbench scores, compared to the Note 4, we're seeing fairly modest gains here. Uh, we have the Exynos Octa-Core from last year clocked at 1.3. This time it's clocked at 1.5, and we have 4 gigs of RAM instead of 3 gigs of RAM. So definitely a decent performance gain here. But what's interesting to me is that, at least in my testing, the Galaxy S6 performed a bit better, at least in the multi-core score. So I'm not sure why that is. Uh, that could just be a variable with testing. Compared to the iPhone 6 Plus and its notoriously high single-core score, it still doesn't match it. We also see big gains over the LG G4, especially in the multi-core score, and more closely matched is the OnePlus 2, although it's still ahead of that. In terms of day-to-day -day performance, I can't say there isn't some elements of lag here and there. You may have spotted it during my walkthrough of the software, but generally speaking, it's been very smooth and quick, and it's definitely been a trait of Samsung within the past year or two. They've been able to really speed up performance thanks to the latest version of Android and a streamed down, simplified version of TouchWiz. So I'm really impressed overall by how quick everything operates on here from launching the camera to the fingerprint sensor to the software load times and navigating the user interface. We also have really impressive gaming performance here with that octa-core processor combined with the Mali T760 MP8 GPU. That's a mouthful. So in terms of gaming performance, again, we're at the top of the spectrum for Android devices. In terms of battery performance, the Note 5 has a smaller battery than the Note 4 by 220 million hours. But in my Geekbench testing with a screen at maximum brightness, the Note 5, even though it has a brighter display, outperformed the Note 4 by an hour. That's really impressive. In terms of heavy day-to-day -day use, like I did during my review period in which I'm recording 4K video, which is really draining on the battery, I'm able to get at least 10 hours on a charge with almost three and a half hours to four hours of on-screen time at maximum brightness. That's pretty average for me in terms of performance when I'm testing a device, but of course, you can improve this by dimming the display and doing less things like 4K video recording. In terms of sound quality, it's not so good with the Note 5. Although we have a side face speaker instead of the rear facing speaker it sounds much more hollow and tinny than the rear facing loudspeaker the other problem here is that audio is over processed so it sounds almost robotic it's a little strange i've also noticed this on the galaxy s6 so let's take a listen to them to see how they sound side by side What's up guys, Mike here, the Detroit Borg, checking out the new OnePlus 2. One of the most anticipated new phones of the year. And it's a sequel to one of my favorite phones of last year. So the premise here is still the same. This is called the flagship killer. In this case, it's the 2016 flagship killer. Ultimately, the Galaxy Note 5 is kind of a blown up version of the Galaxy S6 with a really sleek design that adds wireless charging, a sealed in battery, no expandable storage, but we get a stunning display, fantastic camera system, and even better battery life 
life than the previous generation. We also get much better performing software that I think looks a lot better as well. And we get a new and improved S Pen, which adds some functionality. And if you just want a phone with a large display like I do, you can't do any better than the Note 5. In fact, DisplayMate declares this the best display they've ever tested on a mobile device. Alrighty guys, hope you enjoyed this extensive look at the Galaxy Note 5. It was a lot of work, but of course it's always worth it. If you guys like it, please give it a like to let me know. And please stay tuned for my next video, which will feature the Galaxy S6 Edge Plus. Alright guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you again in the next one.